Welcome to the Colorado Cattlemen's Association webinar on greenhouse gases, specifically methane as it relates to the beef industry. I'd like to start today's webinar talking about the real movement that's taking place in the industry in this country around what we've all seen in the media about the Green New Deal, which is essentially a placeholder that's talking about all things environment, all things climate. Uh, specifically, this piece of legislation didn't move out of the, the Congress because it was stopped in the Senate. That being said, we do fully expect that there will be a fair amount of movement in the foreseeable future around environmental regulation, um, of which some of that will come back around to the, uh, the beef industry. So let's take a look at our beef industry and get a better sense of what we're dealing with as it relates to, to the cattle industry. We really have led very strongly with talking about beef sustainability in the context that we can talk about meeting global demand by balancing really the triple, triple bottom line, uh, the environmental responsibility, economic opportunity, and social diligence throughout our supply chain. The good news in all of this is the beef industry has made significant improvements over our history and very significant, up to 5% in just six years, six years to help meet those needs. And really a lot of this is based off of what we see leading in the future, and that's that we're going to have 70% more people on this planet that are going to be requiring nutritious, safe, healthy diets by 2050. It's no small undertaking that any of us are endeavoring upon. Uh, in fact, it's very significant and it's part of the responsibility we as beef producers take very seriously when it comes to feeding the world. Well, let's take a second and get back to greenhouse gases as it relates to the beef industry, specifically methane. Methane is a, is a large subject matter area that gets discussed related to climate change or greenhouse gases and what we need to analyze as a beef industry is what our effect or our contribution is to that in net overall. Methane is produced primarily within our, within our beef production sector from enteric methane production, which is we have an animal that's a ruminant. That ruminant has uh, small micro, microflora in its digestive tract, and methane gets produced. And it's, a, it's from that fermentation, those microbes on that complex grass that really has very little use for anything other than uh, raising healthy, nutritious product for beef because it's inedible uh, to many other animals and certainly for use in humans. In cattle, 85 to 90% of the methane that's produ produced in livestock, cattle, is expelled from the rumen via the animal's mouth. Um, eructation, uh, in layman's terms, burping. Uh, and it increases when you increase feed intake or increase those forages, those complex hays and grasses in their diet. Methane production will decrease, though, conversely, when you increase corn in the diet or fat in the diet. Uh, and it will reduce that methane production. So in our sectors of the beef industry, we know that uh, our reproductive base, our range cow uh, population, uh, is exhibiting uh, more methane production because they are on those complex grasses. But as we move into the fed sector, which is part and parcel to that cow-calf and that range sector related to the product that we produce, a portion of their lives in the feedlot. So you see a converse reduction because of the feeding of, of corn and fats. And it's a whole system. Um, it goes hand in hand uh, with traditional and conventional beef production um, in the United States. Let's take a look at methane a little bit more closely and look at the trends that we've seen. In short, this graphic illustrates uh, where methane comes from. On the left, that language indicates that methane production has increased, but generally it increases as we see an increase in cattle population. So that's, that's sort of the rule of thumb here is as we see that increase 
uh, as we as we see cattle numbers increase, and it's a natural di process of our digestive process in cattle, ruminant animals specifically. So as you think about a ruminant or a four compartment animal, really what we're looking at is cattle, sheep, goats, buffalo, or bison, and those microbes that are in that rumen that break down or decompose those products, and they emit a gas. That's enteric methane production again. We also see other methane produ production uh, coefficients in the right-hand graphic, and uh, those, some of those are from agriculture, some of those from commercial interests, but we're speaking speci specifically about methane production here, of which um, out of total greenhouse gas production or all emissions, methane's about 10%. So let's take a look at the beef animal or the history of rumens or ruminants uh, throughout history and look at their enteric methane production. Uh, and these is based off of 2015 numbers uh, that estimates methane emissions from wild ruminants versus our current uh, conventional cattle herd. And we look at those wild ruminants prior to the 15th century where we saw different populations of bison. Um, and those populations are a low, medium, and high population, roughly 30, 50, or 75 million head of bison um, compared to that, that 2015 cattle production number. So you can see very easily from this graph that the 2015 beef cattle numbers equate to the median bison population during this time period. Uh, you can also see that there was a lower period with bison production, but that the highest bison production was some 43, 44% higher than beef cattle production is currently. So we certainly at one point in time had fewer bison um, but we significantly had more bison on our planet and on our range than we currently have cattle. So we know clear back to the 15th century, we've had bison producing enteric methane production, um, in many cases higher than cattle populations do. And as we look at how that compares over time um, with things like climate change, or total greenhouse gas production, uh, that becomes the question of do beef cattle, did bison significantly per, um, contribute to things like climate change? And we'll get to that in a second. So let's take a look at total US greenhouse gas emissions and get a little bit better feel for that. So if we look at enteric methane production as a picture of total greenhouse gases, um, this graphic will show us that, and I believe this was an EPA-based study, it'll illustrate that beef cattle total production of greenhouse gases is approximately 1%, 1.8%, all of agriculture, additional agriculture, six, so 7.8% out of total agriculture. Really, we see a lot of production in human-caused emissions, and that's post-consumer waste and things along those lines that are really contributing to that greenhouse gas and or methane production. Let's move forward and take a look at this in just a slightly different graphic and acknowledging that if you were to remove beef cattle from the U.S. diet, beef production from the U.S. diet, really what you would see is a very minimal impact on greenhouse emissions. Again, that 1.8, 1.9%. This is a, an Environmental Protection Agency study, and, and it does illustrate that we are a very de minimis contributor to those emissions. Moving forward, though, how does this all play out in the media, though? What does it mean for major retailers uh, within our um, food production system. So if we look at McDonald's, McDonald's was the first restaurant and company to just set approved science-based targets to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And they, the company has an expectation to prevent 150 million metric tons of emissions. 150 million metric tons of emissions. 
Um, and it's going to par partner with their franchisees and their suppliers to reduce these emissions 36% um, by 2030 from their 2015 announcement date. Um, they have committed firmly to a 31% reduction in em emissions um, related to uh, food and packaging across the supply chain by 2030 based off of those 2015 levels. And uh, this has been run through the science-based targets initiative in order to arrive at those numbers. But it's really important to understand where you can achieve those greenhouse uh, gas emission reductions. Are we going to achieve those in the beef industry, which is a major provider of protein at McDonald's? Do we have the capacity to do that? Again, reflecting back on that EPA study of saying that total greenhouse gas, we're only 1.8%. So really McDonald's and other companies are gonna have to focus on that post-consumer waste, transportation, things along those lines. As we move forward and we look at some additional studies, a more recent study was done by USDA's Ag Research Study. And the finding there was that greenhouse gas emissions from U.S. beef production and, and our inputs, not just from the animal, but and our inputs are not significant contributors to climate change. So if you add that input component, not just the animal, but you add that input component, transportation fees, other things like that, fuels, that brings us only up to 3.3% of all U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. Ag in total accounts for 9%, very de minimis. Um, the fossil fuels we use in beef production only accounted for less than 1% of those consumed nationally. We, to produce the volume of product that we have, only consume 1% of those fossil fuels that are consumed nationally. And we're trading all of this in exchange for the use of landscapes that are too rocky, too steep, too arid to cultivate other crops, yet they still promote and support an upcycling of that grass and of those plants into healthy, nutritious beef products that feed the world. That is a phenomenal upcycling story. In fact, the U.S. produces 18% of the world's beef, 18% with only 8% of the world's cattle population. That is an amazing statistic related to our efficiency and the ability to do more with less. So why is all of this important? Because there are groups out there and entities out there that will say that the U.S. beef production cycle is significantly harming our environment. What we've learned today in this webinar is that's not the truth. But we have to communicate. We have to talk about those things. Case in point, 2008, there was a rule, CERCLA, EPCRA, and that rule attempted to have ag report under, under these laws that were put in place by EPA and sued on by the environmental community and the court decided in their favor and said, yes, agriculture should report. These are, these are laws that are used for Superfund sites, really significant environmental deterior, deteriorating sources, not for agriculture. But guess what? We hear buzzwords around all of this. They talk about factory farms being the major contributor. It's a buzzword that comes out of all of this. And soon the science, the facts are lost in all of this. And the activist messaging gets ahead because we don't message ourselves as much as what we should, of which this webinar, I think, does a very good job of doing that and should be shared. The outcome of this was good for us. Um, there was a piece of legislation signed into law that essentially removed us from consideration under CERCLA and APCRA. 
uh, and it was very thoughtfully done. There was a good coalition built around it. We did change that as an industry. Phenomenal uh, amount of work that went into that. But let's get back to what we're really interested in talking about, and that's the phenomenal ability of upcycling through properly managed cattle production and what it means. What does it mean? How have we increased those efficiencies? Well, let's take a look at some of the numbers, some of the areas that we've seen increase. How sustainable are we? It's a great word to say that we're sustainable. People understand sustainable, but let's talk about what sustainable means to an industry that believes they're sustainable, like the beef industry, and knows they're sustainable. We've increased the use of precision farming and technology. We've improved our crop yields, our genetics. We do advanced things like biogas capture and conversion and used on the farm or the ranch. And we've done in our processing phases right-sized packaging. We don't waste as much packaging in our production facilities. The facts are clear. We've decreased our emissions to water by 10%. It's huge. And to the soil by 7%. Greenhouse gases have gone down. We're already, we were low before, we're lower now. Another thing that's really important to society is making sure that we're really watching our occupational illnesses and accidents. We need safe people as well as a safe product. And we've decreased that by 32% throughout our system. That's a huge number. It's a benchmark that others are strive to. 2% energy and resource consumption decrease and 3% water use. And water, of course, is very important in Colorado. And we're contributing to conservation through these actions. So the message, the message that we need to leave with our consumers, those who would detract and try to say that beef production is harmful to the climate, is that we're sustainable. We balance our economies, our, social, our societies, our environmental issues. We recognize that there will be trade-offs, and the beef industry is not afraid of some of those trade-offs. We know that we are environmentally producing a sustainable product that doesn't give significant amounts of greenhouse gas emissions, methane emissions. In fact, it is not even ranking on the scale of contributing to anything associated with climate change. If we took away beef production, would it really matter? Would it really matter? No, it really wouldn't. We would have a starving, insufficiently nutrient population. We would not be feeding them well. We would see more fertilizer used. We would see more soil erosion without, the, without animals harvesting that natural forage. We may see some limited greenhouse gas emissions, maybe around 2.5% lower. All of that in trading off what is an upcycled product that's feeding the world at a cost-efficient level that's good for our environment, good for our people, and great for our economy. To find out more, visit coloradocattle.org and look for future webinars from the association. Thank you very much.